Hi, I am the Teeth Man, and I am going to discuss today enamel and its basic histology. Yeah, that's, that's basically it, man. All right, enough, uh, enough of that. Enamel is basically calcium hydroxy apatite. It is 95% inorganic crystals, which are calcium hydroxy apatite and fluoroapatite crystals, which might have magnesium, calcium, or other metal ions that take up lattice spaces inside the structure. It is 3% organic substances, which mainly include proteins like amylogenins and non-amylogenins, which are enamelin, tuftalin, ameloblastin, and other substances. It has 2% of water that is integrated into these, into these uh, structures. These are some of the chemical properties. Your, whatever text you follow, it will have some, some of the physical properties mentioned. And you can, you can directly see that it has a very high noop hardness number of 296, which means that it's, a, it's the hardest tissue in the body. No other uh, tissue has fractured toughness like enamel. You can, you can clearly see that the fracture toughness of enamel is almost three times that of any biologically, non-biologically available uh, hydroxy appetite. Now, enamel is selectively permeable to substances which means that whenever people eat and there are substances in saliva, some of it can be allowed into the structure of enamel. That is how fluoride and other ions get um, integrated into the structure of enamel. It is soluble in acidic media and it is, yeah, it's, it's basically very hard. It's like Scarlett Johansson in a red dress hard. Anyway, um, color of enamel depends on its translucency which is a factor of how thick it is. Hmm. It is around 2.5 millimeter at the cusp tips and almost as thin as a knife edge near the cervical regions. Now, if you, if you, take, a, if you take a section of enamel, a longitudinal section of enamel, you will be able to see the enamel prisms in the, in the longitudinal sections and they appear as dark and light bands. Well, not bands exactly, but you can see the crystals. The darker areas show hypomineralization and the lighter areas are well-mineralized areas. And if you take a cross-section, it is essentially a fish scale pattern. This is a very zoomed-in image, which will show uh, the enamel rods. Now, if I can show you by drawing this, this is essentially a, a prism-like structure. So this is the long thing that you see over here. And this is basically this. So if you take a, you take a cross section, you see this and this and this. Uh, well, you get the idea. Anyway, in cross sections, you can see a fish scale pattern. If you zoom out the image a little bit. So in all animals, it is not appear uh, in all animals. It does not appear as a fish scale pattern in some animals. It may appear circular or it may appear as a like semi semicircular pattern. You can see over here that in some animals, there are circular patterns of enamel rods and inter rod enamel. And over here, you can see that you can see the you can see the uh, fish scale pattern of enamel. This is basically this is basically like this. So you can you can see the rod sheath over here, and then inside there are these enamel rods. A bunch of 
a bunch of enamel rods in there. All right, you get the idea? All right, moving on. Enamel rods essentially are present in a sinusoidal pattern from the DEJ to the cuspid tip, which means it is almost vertical at the DEJ and almost vertical at the cusp tips. So if this is near the cusp tip and this is near the DEJ, these are almost vertical. So this is near the DEJ and this is near the cusp tip. So it gets almost horizontal near the middle. And it almost acts like a spring. So whenever it is taking any masticatory load, it can, it can easily, you know, readjust a little bit to take much more force than if it were a straight crystal that would just fracture under the stress. Now to discuss some of the features that are visible in, uh, in the sections of enamel. You can see hunter Schreger bands in enamels, which is essentially a phenomenon of light. It can only be seen in plain polarized lights and it has dark and light bands called parazones and diazones. Now, what are these parazones and diazones? Parazones and diazones appear in plain polarized light because plain, polar, uh, uh, plain, <laughs> plain polarized light tends to bend differently while passing through the mineralized and hypomineralized areas of enamel or or through different different you know translucent areas so the light bends and it creates this band like dark and light band pattern that can be seen whenever one views a section of enamel in plain polarized light in this section you can see enamel tufts which are like tufts of grass that extend from the dj towards the cuspid tip and you can also see some stry. Now, enamel spindles are dark bands that almost look like cracks across the section of enamel. They are, they are, they have multiple reasons of origin. They could be formed by poorly calcified rods, or they could have degenerating cells, or they could be filled with organic debris from saliva that take the place of organic matter that never crystallized inside those spindles. They are of, they are of basically three types. Now moving on to stri of redzius. Stri of redzius are bands of light and dark patterns that appear in longitudinal sections, which essentially show that enamel is deposited in a rhythmic pattern that depends on the circadian rhythm of the body. There are, there are times when there is more, mineral, more, more mineralization and less mineralization, which causes darker and lighter areas, which means that the lighter areas will be much more mineralized than the darker areas. And they will appear as these stri of redzius. You can, you can clearly see the stri in this uh, diagram over here. And these stri, when they extend outwards, when they're extending outwards towards the uh, surface of the enamel, they appear as these perichymotor ridges. And if the, if the teeth has not, if the teeth have not suffered a lot of uh, masticatory forces and it is still a newly erupted teeth, they can be clearly seen on the teeth of newborns and uh, newly erupted teeth. Now a really big stri of redzius can be seen at some parts of the teeth, which essentially shows the developmental change that happened when the baby came out of the mother's womb. Inside the mother's womb, the baby gets a very safe and well adjusted environment for the body to lay down enamel. So the enamel that is laid down while the individual is inside their mother's womb is much more mineralized than when they leave and you know. That's, that's, it's all the way down, man, after that. <laughs> anyway, it's not, it's not so bad. You can, you can deal with it. Just read some young or Nietzsche. You get the hang of it. Anyway, the DEJ. DEJ is the dentina enamel junction, which is the junction point of enamel and dentine. Now enamel is laid down by odontoblasts and 
sorry dentin is laid by laid down by odontoblasts and enamel is laid down by ameloblasts so ameloblasts originate from the um, pre ameloblasts which are from the inner enamel epithelium and they are usually of ectodermal origin and the dentin comes from all they also come from ectodermal origin but they actually come from neural crest cells which are which give rise to ectomesenchymal cells and they give rise to odontoblasts and they form dentin and when these are laid down they move towards each other and they meet at a scalloped in a, they meet in a scalloped fashion where the dentinal tubules meet the enamel surface and they they essentially have a scalloped surface for so that the enamel has a better adherence to the dentinal surface so that it can take all that all that force while chewing when you're when you're chewing on that nice leg of chicken that is that is almost all of it yeah man that's all of it so i would like to thank the writers of and people in production of 10k oral histology and oral anatomy histology and embryology fifth edition by bernard berkowitz and moxim and holland for these beautiful diagrams that they have and see you next time <laughs> Yeah, there you go.